Lecture two, what is myth? Hello and welcome back to lecture two. In our previous lecture, we began talking about the difficulty of defining exactly what myth is and how it functions. In this lecture and in lecture number three, we're going to continue our discussion of what myth is and how it can be defined. And in particular, we're going to look at several of the most influential theories about myth that developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, as I said in the previous lecture, the question, what is myth? has no easy or obvious answer. One thing that we can dispense with right away is the usage of the term myth in popular speech to mean a lie or a misconception or a mistaken belief. That doesn't concern us here. For instance, if someone says love at first sight is just a myth, what they mean by that is something along the lines of that's a mistaken belief, a misconception, it doesn't really happen. That's a very common usage of the term myth, but clearly that's not what we're dealing with here. Despite the fact that myth is so difficult to define precisely, most people seem to have a sense that there is such a category as myth, that we're not just chasing a chimera here, but there is such a category as myth, and most people have the sense that they know it when they see it, that when we are told a story or read a story that is a myth, we somehow sense a difference in that from other kinds of stories that we may be told or that we may read. We can begin to try to close in on what myth is, what that difference is between myth and other forms of story, how we know it when we see it, by identifying some characteristics of myth to supplement the working definition that I gave you in the previous lecture. If you remember, that definition started by saying that myths are traditional stories or traditional tales that a society tells. Let's think about the implications of the term traditional tales. Myths are tales, myths are stories. That may seem so obvious that it doesn't need to be said, but it is worth focusing on just for a second. There are many forms of human communication that are not stories. Even if they follow a logical narrative order, they're not stories. These lectures, for instance, I hope follow a logical narrative order, but they're not stories, despite the fact that they are communication. Myth is story. If something is not a story, it's not a myth. And I would push that far enough to say that a representation of a myth in artwork is just that, a representation of a myth in artwork. This behind me is a representation of the birth of Venus or Aphrodite in her Greek name. It's not the myth of the birth of Aphrodite. So myths are stories and they are traditional stories. I touched on that pretty thoroughly in the last lecture, but here it's worth just pointing out what one implication of that, which is that stories handed down from generation to generation in a society normally cannot be attributed to any one author or any one originator. Put another way, it's usually impossible to tell who first thought up a story that becomes a myth, who invented it. And that means that one major difference between myths and other forms of stories that we may be more familiar with, such as novels, plays, poems, that kind of thing, is that we don't know who invented a myth. It's traditional. It's changed over time. It's handed down through generations. Now, obviously, if you think about it logically, there must have been someone who first told any story that later becomes a myth. But the point is that someone is lost in time. We don't know who it was who invented a myth. Going along with the idea that myths are traditional stories handed down through time is another characteristic that's very important in myth, namely that myths are stories set in the past. Myths do not deal with what's happening today or this week or even last year. We don't have myths about current time. Myths are set in the past, often in the very remote past, frequently in the time before the world was entirely set in the way it was going to be from there on out. And as part of being set in the past, myths very frequently reflect a sense that in the remote past, things were quite different in many ways than they are now. Very frequently, the idea is that in the remote past, things were much better 
than they are now, that there was some kind of golden age that we have somehow lost. But almost invariably, things in myth are different than they are now. Gods and humans interact more freely. Things in the world are still changeable. People can still turn into trees from time to time, that sort of thing. Myths deal with a time when the order of the world is a little bit different than it is now, or sometimes a great deal different than it is now, and that time is set in the remote past. Another characteristic of myth that we touched on in the last lecture, but it's worth bringing out in more detail, is that they are ostensibly true. That is, they present themselves within the society in which they develop as factual accounts of how things actually happened in that remote past in which they are set. It would be very rare for any culture to recognize its own mythology as mythology. In fact, I think I would go so far as to say that once a culture looks at its own traditional stories and says these are our myths, that culture no longer believes in those myths as a living entity. Another way of putting that, which is somewhat paradoxical, but I think a valid statement, is that myth is a category that really only exists when you're outside a culture looking in. From within any culture, myths are accounts of the way things really are. It's only when we step outside the culture and look in that we can say these stories are myths. What do these stories do, these traditional tales that people tell? Why do they tell them? Well, myths do many things. Among the most obvious functions that they fulfill is myths often explain, justify, instruct, or warn. Explanatory myths are often called etiological myths. That comes from the Greek word etion, which means cause. Explanatory myths may explain why things are as they are, how certain events or entities came into being, why conditions in the world are the way they are. Perhaps the most obvious and most famous etiological myth of classical mythology is the story of the the goddess Demeter, goddess of grain and the harvest, grieving for her lost daughter Persephone, who had been kidnapped by Hades, king of the dead. When Persephone is in the underworld with her husband Hades, Demeter grieves and no grain grows. When Persephone comes back to spend two-thirds of the year with her mother, Demeter is happy and the grain grows again. Very clearly an etiology for why there are seasons. Why is there a time of the year when nothing grows? This myth gives an explanation for why that should be so. Another function that myths fulfill is to offer a justification <clears throat> for a certain rite or social institution, a certain ritual in honor of a god, a social institution such as marriage, whatever. Myths that provide justification for social rights or institutions are very frequently called charter myths. Myths may also instruct their audience in how the audience ought or more frequently ought not to behave. Myths very frequently instruct through presenting horrible warnings of what is likely to happen to people who transgress the boundaries of proper human behavior. So myths provide instruction in how humans ought and ought not to behave. They don't do that transparently very frequently. They don't come right out and say this is what you ought or ought not to do. Rather, through the narrative line of the story, the audience draws its own conclusions about proper behavior very frequently through seeing improper behavior. And obviously, myths very frequently concern gods and the supernatural, though drawing on my discussion of the division into myth, legend, and folktale in the previous lecture, I do not say that myths have to involve gods and the supernatural, but certainly they very frequently concern gods and the supernatural. Here we're in an area of myth that overlaps with religion and it can be quite difficult to determine whether a particular narrative should be called a myth or should be studied as part of a religion. One useful distinction, one way of categorizing is to say that religion refers to what people actually do to honor their gods. The rites, ceremonies, rituals, and so forth that people enact in honor of their gods, whereas myth refers to the underlying narratives, the narratives that explain or justify or go along with those rites, rituals, and ceremonies. Now, here again, the categorization of certain narratives about gods or divinities as myths depends entirely on the observer's stance with regard to the gods or divinities in question. Looked at from inside a religion, 
certain stories can be profound, in fact, crucial religious truths. Looked at from outside the religion, those same stories would be categorized as myth. For example, from inside Christianity, the stories of the virgin birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ are central narratives, all important narratives, and within Christianity, those are accepted as unquestionably true narratives. Looked at from the outside, looked at from the point of view of a non-Christian, those stories are myths. They're myths told about the divinity of Jesus Christ. So it depends entirely on the audience member's stance with regard to the religion in question, whether a particular religious narrative is a true narrative or a myth. As I said before, myth is a category that really only exists from the outside looking in. Now, from antiquity onwards, many scholars have come up with theories that attempt to define myth or to explain how myth functions, why it functions as it does, what it is that myth is doing. As I was working on these lectures, it occurred to me that the most important theories of myth that developed in the 19th and 20th centuries could be very broadly divided into two main types of theories, which for simplicity's sake I'm calling the what theories and the why theories. Now this is a very broad categorization and certainly there's overlap between the two types, but here's what I mean by that terminology. What theories, as I'm calling them, attempt to explain myth by identifying it as a subcategory, a derivative, or a forerunner of something else, such as history, ritual, philosophy, that kind of thing. At their worst, these theories are excessively reductive. What theories tend to say that myth is only misunderstood history or is only primitive science, or is only the first attempt at philosophy, or something else. So these theories have a tendency to become overly reductionist. For example, there was a Greek thinker named Euhemerus, who lived around 300 BC, who suggested that all myths were originally misremembered history. The gods of Greece had actually been great kings who lived way back in prehistory and whose characteristics were exaggerated through time. So that Zeus had been a very great king, according to Euhemerus, and as people recounted his, his stories through time, recounted his legends, if you like, they exaggerated his characteristics until he became Zeus, the great god, the primary Olympian, Zeus who hurls the thunderbolt, father of gods and men. Later versions of this theory, and this is one that has had a very long run for its money, it keeps popping up even in the late 20th century, later versions of this theory that myth is basically misremembered history are called euhemerism, after euhemerus, the inventor, the first inventor of the theory. But even at its best, euhemerism and other what theories tend to ignore the essential quality, whatever it is that makes us recognize myths as myths. In attempting to explain myth by saying it's nothing but misremembered history, Euhemerus really explains nothing at all. Let's grant him for the moment that it is. I don't think it is, but let's grant him for the sake of, of argument that myth is only misremembered history. That Zeus originally was just a great king. Euhemerus has not told us why the story of that great king developed into the story of the numinous, awe-inspiring Zeus who hurls the thunderbolt. Even if he's right that it did, that Zeus was originally a king whose story developed into a story of a god, he hasn't explained why that should happen, what it is that makes that particular kind of story particularly appealing. Why theories, as opposed to what theories, look for wider explanations, try to identify the impetus within the human mind or human culture that motivates myth-making. Psychological and structuralist theories fall under my heading of why theories. Why theories generally assume that myth is an extracultural or transcultural phenomenon. By that I mean they tend to assume that the same narrative elements serve the same function in different cultures. So that a story about a snake, for instance, is going to have the same resonance, the same meaning, the same function in different cultures, according to why theories. And if what theories suffer from being overly reductionist, why theories tend to, be, tend to suffer from being overly general and overly vague, uh, from saying that 
the same stories mean the same things in all cultures at all times, and we don't need to demonstrate that. We can simply assume it. I'll talk more about why theories in the next lecture. Now, as I already said, there is some overlap between the two types of theories. As we shall see, Watt theories were more common in the 19th century, um, mesmerized as it was by science and the scientific method. Why theories are much more common in the extremely psychologically oriented 20th century, and I suppose that would come as a surprise to nobody. One very popular Watt theory that has been resurrected over and over again since antiquity is the theory that myths are simply a form of allegory. That when a narrative, a mythic narrative, talks about Demeter and Persephone, it is really talking about something else. This obviously overlaps with or slides into the idea of ideological myths, but allegory, the allegorical theory of myth, says again that that's all that myths are. They are always allegorical and they are purely allegorical. The most famous allegorical theory or interpretation of myth was developed in the 19th century by a scholar named Max Muller, who came up with what is often called the solar mythology theory. According to Mueller, not only were myths misunderstood allegories, they were misunderstood allegories about one particular thing, the battle between light, specifically sunlight, and darkness, hence the name the solar mythology theory. Mueller claimed that all classical myths were in their origin statements about the sun rising in the morning and putting the darkness to flight. Even so sophisticated and complex a narrative as the Odyssey, according to Mueller, was at heart simply a statement about the sun rising and chasing away the night. Odysseus's battles with gods and monsters, all his adventures represented the sun overcoming darkness. In a phrase that has become infamous, Mueller said that mythology was actually a disease of language. By that he meant that as terms changed their meaning through time, the people within Greek culture lost sight of the original meanings of statements and started to misinterpret them as statements about anthropomorphic entities. An example will probably help to clarify what I mean here. Mueller claimed, for instance, that when in the earliest stage of Greek society someone made the statement, maiden dawn arose, the term maiden simply meant in that context early. That was all it meant. As the word changed its meaning through time and came to mean a young unmarried female entity, the statement made in dawn arose was misinterpreted, misunderstood to mean there is a young female entity called dawn and she got up. She arose from her bed. So according to Mueller, all mythology is at heart a disease of language of that kind, and mythology is simply a statement about the sun and darkness. Mueller's theory was extremely influential in the 19th century, but nobody, and I think that's safe to say, nobody believes it today. It is no longer accepted or taken um, as valid by any scholar of myth. The primary challenge to Mueller's theory in the 19th century was mounted by another great and famous 19th century scholar, Andrew Lang, who saw explanation as the essential function of myth, not allegory, not that myths were misunderstood statements about something else, but that myths were attempts at explaining phenomena that could not otherwise be explained. Myth, Lang thought, was driven by the same impulse that would later develop into science. And in fact, he said that myth was, in effect, primitive science. So as Euhemerus said, myth was misremembered history, Lang said, no, it's not history at all, it's science, but it's primitive science. It's science that hasn't yet developed the scientific method. This means that all myths, according to Lang, were basically ideological, basically explained causes of things and how things came to be as they were. Now, one of the most influential theorists of myth and one of the most famous theorists of the late 19th and early 20th century was Sir James Fraser. Fraser modified the idea of myth as explanation to argue that myth in all societies was specifically an explanation for ritual. He thought that very frequently myths were 
narratives about rituals remembered after the rituals had fallen into disuse so that very frequently one could not identify the ritual to which a myth had originally been attached that the narratives remained after the rituals were no longer performed but he saw myths original function as an explanation of ritual now in all of these theories i'm simplifying to an extent that sort of frightens me in fraser's case in particular his work his main work the golden bow is an extraordinarily complex work its first edition was two volumes by the time he published the third edition it had grown to 11 volumes and obviously trying to summarize the thesis of an 11 volume work in about two minutes is very difficult but Fraser's most important strand of argument was his claim about what he called a king of the wood, a man, a human king, who supposedly represented or embodied the vegetation god, the god who causes all things to grow, causes plant fertility, human fertility, animal fertility. Fraser's theory was that societies originally had rituals in which an actual human man called the king for the year or so that he was king, embodied the god and was then killed by his successor. You can't have a god who ages and grows old, particularly not a god of fertility who grows weak and sick and old. So he's killed each year by another young successor. Fraser claimed to demonstrate the prevalence of this mythic pattern throughout human society by gathering examples from all sorts of different cultures. But though the Golden Bough was a pioneering work of scholarship, Fraser's methodology was grievously flawed. In particular, he collected examples from various different cultures but ripped them entirely out of context. He assumed that the slightest resemblance of narrative detail must mean precisely similar ritual function, which is a very big assumption to make, that a detail in one society, a narrative detail in one society, must function precisely the same way as a similar detail functions in another society. That's a very large assumption to make. And no, I think no scholars today would accept Fraser's theory in its entirety, though, as I said, he was a pioneering scholar and his work is fascinating as an element in the history of scholarship and particularly scholarship on mythology. Fraser's work was also the inspiration for a whole so-called school of myth theory often referred to as the Cambridge School or the Cambridge Ritualists. Centered in Cambridge, England, these scholars saw ritual as the primary motiv motivating force for myth, though they disagreed with Fraser about which rituals were most important. After Fraser, the next important school of myth theory was functionalism, which was pioneered by a scholar named Bronislav Malinowski. Malinowski happened to be marooned on the Trobriand Islands during World War I. He couldn't get back to Europe until the war ended. So while he was there, he decided to, st to study the indigenous myths of the Trobriand Islanders in their native habitat, learned the language, talked to the people, and decided that, or concluded that, the defining characteristic of myth was its functionalism, its functionality within a society, and that's why his school of thought is called functionalism. He said that far from trying to explain things or being allegories or necessarily being connected with ritual, myths were functional. In particular, myth contributes to society, according to Malinowski, by helping to maintain the social system. Its origin is less important than its function. In fact, Malinowski denied not only that myth's primary purpose is to explain, he even said that myths have no meaning outside themselves, that they do not refer to anything outside themselves and the societies in which they function. Their main primary, in fact only, function is to help justify and maintain the social system in which they arise. So. This is, in a way, almost opposite to Fraser's idea that the same narrative elements cross-culturally and throughout time indicate the same mythic impulse. Malinowski would say, no, myth is purely limited to the culture in which it arises. It justifies, explains, and provides a charter for, that's his term, provides a charter for the social system in which it originates. Charter myths, according to Malinowski, 
provide a validation for the social institutions they describe, and that is their main function. It was Malinowski, by the way, who also posited the hard and fast distinction between myth, legend, and folklore that I talked about before. Among the Trobriand Islanders, he found, the Islanders themselves, the people who recounted their traditional tales to him, made this distinction between myth as stories about the gods, legend as stories about heroes or great men who had once lived, and folktale as stories that existed purely for entertainment. And he thought that that distinction was valid cross-culturally, that in all societies we should categorize only stories about the gods as myth and other traditional tales as either legend or folktale. However, as I said in the first lecture, that distinction does not apply nearly so well to classical myth as it applies to its native home in the Trobriand Islands. Now, each of these theories, which I've gone through so quickly, has struck its critics as unsatisfactory in at least some regards. Some of the theories seem way too restrictive. The most obvious example is clearly the solar mythology theory of the 19th century. and That one's easy even to make fun of because it's so restrictive. It seems obvious to us at the end of the 20th century that whatever myth is doing, it's something more than simply saying the sun rises every morning and the night goes away. But other theories too fall short in this regard. If myths must be tied to rituals, if Fraser and the Cambridge School are correct and myth implies ritual, myth is simply the narrative that goes along with ritual, then what do we do with traditional stories that seem to have no ritual associations whatsoever? In classical myth, for instance, the struggles of the gods for power, which we'll talk about when we get to Hesiod's Theogony in Lecture 4, as far as we know, have no connection with any ritual that ever happened. Are they then not myths? How do we account for stories that are not connected with rituals? If myths must concern the gods, how do we account for stories about Oedipus, Perseus, Theseus, many of the most famous myths, to call them that, of Greek mythology deal with heroes and do not deal directly or primarily with gods. If myths must provide charters for social institutions, if Malinowski is correct in that regard, how do we explain myths that don't seem to perform any such function? Again, take the example of the birth of Aphrodite from the foam of the sea. What social institution finds its charter in that story? I can't think of one. Certainly there's no obvious answer to that. Now, <clears throat> with all of these objections, in each case, the theorist would probably say, or could say, take the simple way out and say that any stories that don't fit the theory are by definition not myths at all, but some other type of story, some other type of traditional tale. This narrowing the definition to make the theory work is not very satisfactory to someone who has not already bought into the theory. I could, if I wanted to, for the purpose of this course, say I define myths as stories about entities whose names begin with A. And therefore, I could say if, something, if, a, if a story is not about a god whose name begins with A, it's not a myth for the purposes of this course. I'm only going to talk about Aphrodite, Apollo, Artemis, Achilles, so forth. And believe me, as I was trying to think of some way to limit this course to a manageable size, something like that was rather tempting. But I could make that definition. It wouldn't persuade anyone. And that's obviously an exaggeration. But any theory that says any story that doesn't fit my theory is by definition not a myth is really taking a very easy way out and is leaving something to be desired. Another answer, and one that most theorists will probably consider deserves more serious attention, would be to say that in any case where there is no apparent match of the myth to the ritual or the myth as a charter to justify some social institution or whatever, then the myth has undergone change or corruption which has disguised its original character. So Malinowski, for instance, would probably answer my objection about the birth of Aphrodite by saying, well, it did provide a charter for some social institution. We just don't know what that social institution was. The Cambridge ritualists would probably say about my objection to the stories of the gods' struggle for powers, there were rituals to match those myths. We just no longer have any evidence of those rituals. This, again, is a form of special pleading. 
and it's persuasive only to those who have already accepted the theory in question. If we accept that all myths must be tied to ritual, if we take that as our first premise, then when we find a myth that doesn't seem to be tied to ritual, we have no recourse except to say, well, we just don't know what the ritual was. But if we don't start with the first premise, myth must be tied to ritual, then it certainly looks as though many myths are not. So these theories tend to require acceptance of the theory first and some manipulation of the evidence second to make the theory work, which is troubling, at least to many scholars. It seems to me better to admit that so far, no monolithic theory, the term monolithic is the scholar Jeffrey Kirks, no monolithic theory of myth so far has completely defined or explained what myth is. Someone may yet come up with such a theory, but it hasn't been done yet. So in this lecture, we've continued trying to determine what myth is. We've surveyed a few important what theories. In, and in our next lecture, we'll move on to looking at some of the most important why theories of the 20th century, specifically psychological and structuralist theories.